Motorsport is an always changing world. Whenever it's time to develop a new racing car, there's always someone who thinks outside the box and crafts something completely different from their opponents. Sometimes these cars are more of a mistake rather than being revolutionary, sometimes they underperform or simply never get to race. But there have been a few times when these cars became icons, an example of how far we can go with our creativity and brilliance. That's where the magic happens. This is the case of the Delta Wing, arguably the most ambitious racing car design of the 21st century. A car that not only captured the heart of the community for its unusual triangular design, but it showed how it is possible to achieve speed matching the average LMP2 racing pace even with unconventional approaches nobody dares to take. Half the weight, half the fuel, half the power, half the drag, all of the speed. This is the story of the Delta Wing project. Back in the 2000s, we were living an era of changes in motorsport. Formula One was turning to the modern design of the early 2010s, WEC was starting to shape the iconic LMP1 cars of the Audi era and IndyCar was looking forward to a new chassis for their new generation of cars. This last point is crucial, as many designers and manufacturers consider this as an opportunity to submit their cars to the IndyCar Association. One of them was Ben Bowlby. He was more than a simple racing car designer. Many described him as a genius, a lateral thinker, a brilliant innovator thanks to his vision of engineering, and a leader for the entire team he worked with. That's when the Delta Wing project officially started. His main idea was to propose his car to the IndyCar Association, in the hope to see it as the new generation model for the series. The car didn't catch the eye so well because of its unpleasant look, but despite that, on an engineering level, it was a literal work of a genius. The prominent aspect of the car is surely its triangular design. But is there a particular reason for this choice? Aerodynamics. The perk of the Delta Wing was its coefficient of drag, a resistance, of just 0.24, a number extremely low for an open cockpit racer. No front or rear wings, no aerodynamic devices, just a vertical fin that enables straight line stability. This car was an actual ground-to-ground -ground missile. The downforce was instead generated by the Venturi tunnels on the floor, copied from the 1981 Eagle IndyCar design, conceptually a very similar car approach to the Delta Wing. Everything was then powered by a particular engine, the Nissan DiGT, an evolution of the direct injection turbocharged 1.6-liter inline-4 of the Nissan Juke, tuned to reach 300 brake horsepower. After all, with a car that weighted half of the competitors, a lot of power wasn't needed. An amazingly crafted idea that unfortunately didn't catch the interest of the IndyCar Association. But it did for the ALMS founder, Don Panoff, who saw an incredible potential in the project. He believed that the Delta Wing carried the innovative spirit of Le Mans, and so convinced that then ACO president Jean-Claude Plessard to let the Delta Wing participate to the 2012 24 Hour of Le Mans, representing Garage 56, a special racing class reserved for experimental cars, like in this case, the Delta Wing. Out of the blue, the car was going to take part in the most prestigious race in the world of motor racing. And this was just the beginning. Just after the arrival in France, the entire team was immediately blown away from the media, the fans and the entire paddock. Everyone felt like something coming from space had just landed on Earth. An absolute rock star at Le Mans, as Dan Gurney said. While everyone loved the car and couldn't wait to see it in action, some of the members of the Delta Wing crew were a bit skeptical about the performance and reliability of the project. Marino Franchitti, first driver of the Delta Wing for the 24 hour, believed that one of the biggest problems of the car was its gearbox, which had no hydraulics or control systems, meaning it was prone to reliability issues. The differential didn't work at all, and as a consequence, the car always drove with an open differential, compromising the overall handling. 
Despite that, Bobby was extremely confident about the performance of his car. And he was right. During qualifying, the Delta Wing managed to get a 29th place in the overall standings, even beating some of the participating LMP2s. An excellent result for a car of that kind. In the race, however, it showed some flashes of pace and performance, matching the times of the first LMP2s in class while at the same time saving fuel. It was clear to everyone that the car, despite being far from complete, had the massive potential to become something unique in the field of motor racing. However, the dream didn't last for so long. On the sixth hour, during a full course yellow, the Delta Wing cracked at the Porsche curve, after a contact with the Toyota No. 7 driven by Nakajima. A mistake by the Japanese driver that cost all the hopes for the Delta Wing crew and forced them to retire from the race. Despite that, Bobby didn't give up and was optimistic for the future races of the car. But that's when the first real problems started to show up. The Delta Wing managed to run a few more races in the same year and it clearly caught the attention of racing manufacturers, especially at the 10 hours of Road Atlanta of 2012. During the race, the car showed an extremely fast pace and had a concrete possibility to finish first but as you might guess, competitors weren't so happy to see an unconventional car of that kind beating the majority of the grid. Some blamed the car was not legal at all, some said it wasn't eligible for any of the classes in the field. The newcomer wasn't well welcomed at all, and Don Panath, who at the time was an investor of the project and owner of the racing series the Delta Wing race in, was aware of it. And so, in the effort to mediate a difficult situation like this, he made life a bit complicated for the team. A new set of improvised rules was written and applied exclusively to the Delta Wing. Some of the obligations included starting from the pit, impossibility to start at the front of the field under full course yellow, and many others. Despite all of that, the car still finished fifth, but Lucas Ordonez recognized that the Delta Wing had the potential to reach at least the podium, if it only would have been classified as a regular car without special rules and limitations. Unfortunately, things went a different way. After that, there was nowhere else for the car to race. No racing series or investors wanted to push for a project that most of the manufacturers saw as a threatening revolution. Bobby didn't appreciate that at all, and all of this finally triggered a litigious divorce with Panoth, his first and last main investor. That was the beginning of the end for the Delta Wind project. Just a year later, in 2013, both Panoth and Bowlby decided to take two separated paths. The first took possession of the intellectual property of the project, and with the forces of his own team, improved the performance and reliability of the car with a new Mazda engine which powered 345 brake horsepower. The second, instead, joined forces with Nissan and produced a radical evolution of the project called Nissan ZRC a closed cockpit hybrid electric version of the previous car, meant to race for the 24 hour of Le Mans 2014. While Panoth had some successes in 2013 in the ALMS racing series, taking some podiums, the same couldn't be said for Nissan. At Le Mans, they managed to achieve their goals of reaching a speed above 300 km an hour and completing a lap of the circuit using electric power only. However, after five laps into the 24 hours, the Ziot RC was forced to retire because of a gearbox failure. After that, the project was immediately set aside to focus on the development of the Nissan GTR LM Nismo, which resulted in a total failure. Bobby kept a low profile since then, and shortly after, the Panath Delta Wing became ineligible in IMSA Racing Series following rule changes. The Delta Wing project at this point was officially part of the past. What's curious about the life cycle of the Delta Wing is that it wasn't the concept to be the main reason for its failure. The car was great, fast, and at its peak, even reliable. Instead, it was the real world of motorsport which made intentionally and unintentionally everything in its power to suppress the project. A revolution that never was? Probably yes. Maybe not. We might never know. What we do know is that the Delta Wing showed that the spirit of innovation, even with the strict rules and limitations of modern day racing, 
is still real. Half the weight, half the fuel, half the power, half the drag, all the speed.